Hello, everybody. Welcome to Latter-day Struggles. Happy to have you guys here today. And I am your host, Valerie. And it is really, really great to be back here with you again. As promised, today we are going to be talking a lot more about the LGBTQ plus question and the church's handling of this question. And I'm going to just offer to you some thoughts and feelings that I have from a psychological lens. And I'm going to be looking specifically at a book that is near and dear to my heart by an author that is very near and dear to my heart. The book is No More Goodbyes. The author is none other than the wonderful and amazing Carolyn Pearson. Okay, so just to give you guys a little bit of a background on my experience with Carolyn Pearson, I was acquainted, I became acquainted with her work just not very long ago by reading The Eternal Ghosts of Polygamy. Is that what it's called? The Ghosts of Eternal Polygamy? Gosh. One of those two. Anyways, I loved it. It was one of the more challenging books I have ever read. And then I moved it, moved on to Goodbye, I Love You. And then at the Sunstone Symposium a few months ago, I picked up this book, No More Goodbyes. And I have to tell you that, well, let me just tell you a little autobiographical information about me. You know, I think as far as health issues go, nobody writes for free, right? We all have something that we're managing. And if you aren't managing something yet, give it some time and you will too be managing something yourself. But I have chronic migraine headaches. It's a genetic thing. I've had these for many, many, many years, most of my adulthood. It's a hereditary thing. And I have lots and lots of migraine triggers. I promise you I'm getting to my point here. Here's the deal though. It has occurred to me through much experience that reading Carolyn Pearson is not good for my, is not good for my health. <laughs> the reason why is because I have a lot of trouble with migraines when I cry, which is a bad thing as a psychotherapist and as a trauma therapist, someone who I'm frequently, when I'm sitting with people, I get really, and have a lot of empathy for the suffering of the people that I'm lucky enough to work with. And oftentimes when I cry with people, I get migraine headaches. And it has occurred to me that there is no author that brings this up in me more profoundly than Carolyn Pearson, who I personally feel to be one of the greatest and most gifted writers, thinkers. And I think she's a prophet personally. I think she's a prophet. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I am really, really grateful that I have read her books and I've learned so much from her. And I have come to feel closer to my understanding of truth through the readings of Carolyn Pearson than maybe anybody, you know, more so with these books than anything else I have ever read. So let's just for a minute, I'm going to go ahead and give you a bit of an overview, assuming that some of you have not read any of her work and are not familiar with her. Carolyn Pearson is a poet and she is a woman who has been very influential in the church for, oh gosh, maybe 50 years or so. She is, a, she was a graduate, a graduate from Brigham Young University. She married her sweetheart, Jerry, and very, very early in their marriage, he disclosed to her that he was gay. And they spent the first many years of their marriage trying to work this out and were not able to do so inside of the marriage. So he did eventually leave the marriage and practice a gay lifestyle. And this was, I believe, back in the 80s. And unfortunately, he died of AIDS with her by his side taking care of him because they gained a deep love for one another, even though they, they struggled and suffered deeply as a couple. And they were, but they, to the end, were dear and close friends. And this was a very painful experience for both of them and for their children. And I believe this very experience is likely one of the experiences that has given Carolyn the, the, depth, the, the depth that she has, the compassion, the understanding that she has for the marginalized. She understands issues of gender and sexuality, perhaps better than anybody who I've ever read and learned from. And she has a real heart to help members and leaders of our church better understand the realities of these very, very challenging issues. This is why she wrote the beautiful book about polygamy. And this is also why she has written many, some autobiographical pieces about her relationship with sexual orientation and as it has touched her personally in her life, herself, her husband, their children. And then she has moved on in this book that I'm going to be talking with you about today, where she goes a lot bigger and broader 
And she talks a lot about the experiences of many, many people who have come to her for help and for understanding. And I am really, really looking forward to giving you a little bit of an overview, a little bit of a book review, if you will, today, where I'm going to talk about some of the highlights of the book, but I'm also going to really incorporate some psychological ideas about what is health, what I consider to be some healthy paradigms that she helps me understand. And also what are some very, very unhealthy paradigms that we need to learn from and overcome that are forwarded in some of the doctrine and dogma in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. So one question that I think we can begin with is who is her audience? Who is she writing to? And in her own words, she says, I write to all who find themselves walking that challenging territory where religion and sexuality collide. I think this is beautifully said because religion and sexuality from the beginning of time, and this is not unique to our religion, it's unique to all religion. Religion and sexuality have a very complex and complicated relationship. Religion is typically rather angsty about the idea of sexuality. Most religions have a very fraught relationship with the idea of sexuality and it's very fear oriented. And yet at the same time, every one of us that has a human body needs to come to terms with and come to healthy terms with ourselves as sexual beings and what it means to be a sexual being and what it means to be also a child of divine parentage as sexual beings at the same time. And a lot of times a religion doesn't exactly know how to help us in this realm. And oftentimes in their efforts to help us, they, they don't help us. They actually, religion sometimes does a, a great deal to confuse us, to bring up a lot of in, internal shame. And inadvertently, oftentimes our experience with sexuality through the lens of religion is not helpful, but it is actually in some cases harmful. Carolyn's premise of her, her whole entire book, No More Goodbyes, is, is she begins the book by saying, there are too many goodbyes between ourselves and our LGBTQ plus family and friends. She breaks this down into three parts. There are too many goodbyes between ourselves and our loved ones due to suicide. There are too many goodbyes between ourselves and this population due to ill-fated marriages. And there are too many goodbyes between ourselves and our LGBTQ family and loved ones due to families who are torn apart by beliefs that seem to be more important than people. Okay, so now what I'm going to do with you for the rest of our time to de together today is I am going to walk you through what I consider personally to be five paradigms that are healthy relationship paradigms that I have learned and that I really, really practice and believe deeply through my own work as a psychotherapist. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the rest of our time together today is I am going to break down five ideas of what I consider to be psychologically healthy paradigms that are that help us better justify an openness and a love for an acceptance and an acceptance of our LGBTQ plus friends, family, and loved ones. And in contrast to that, I'm going to talk about the unhealthy paradigms that are forwarded in, in the current doctrine and dogma of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. And then I'm going to also, just to sort of amplify my cause and my arguments is I am going to use Carolyn's own words and stories to strengthen my case about the healthy psychological paradigms that I am going to talk about from my own clinical experience and training. Okay. So healthy paradigm number one, this is the foundation of pretty much all of the work that I personally do as a therapist. This paradigm is at the foundation of all healing. And this is that we are all innately worthy. We are all innately whole. We came to this earth already enough. There's nothing that we need to prove. There's nothing that we need to change. And there's nothing innately wanting about us. And as we become more psychologically whole throughout our lives, we come to realize that we can negotiate our relationship directly with our parents in heaven and our savior, Jesus Christ, with this understanding that before we even began 
we were already whole. There's nothing that we need to prove. And if we're lucky enough and the institutions and people around us can actually validate this innate worthiness, then these institutions and people are, are supplemental and are helpful to our growth and development. But if they're not helpful, then of course, they actually get in the way of our realization that our worthiness is never on the table from the moment that we are born until the moment that we die, that that innate wholeness is always there. Okay, I want to contrast that with the unhealthy paradigm that sometimes what we have done in our church and in other conservative Christian and other kinds of relig religions is we have created a doctrine or a paradigm that there is something innately not okay with us, that there is something innately wanting with us. If you'll go back one episode, I really go deeply into, into Gregory Prince's studies, scientific studies and analysis of this idea that there has been a lot of question that is not related to science. It's just more related to dogma and historical understanding that's not science-based at all, that there is something innately wrong with somebody who is who has sexual orientation that is not heterosexual. This is innately an unhealthy paradigm for a human being to be living under. When the institution tells me that there's something innately wrong with something that is that is sort of how I came, then that is that will deteriorate my sense of self. That will prevent me from creating a strong and, and worthy sense of my own goodness and wholeness. And what I end up, what ends up happening is I become someone who struggles with shame or a sense of lack of worthiness, a sense that there's something at my core that is wrong with me and there's nothing that I can do to overcome this thing. This oftentimes is called internalized shame. And one thing that Carolyn talks about in her No More Goodbyes book, she says this, she says, paradoxically, and to our great shame, the beliefs that prompt these awful goodbyes are attributed to the will of God. What she's saying there is that sometimes because of the doctrines of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we sort of embed in our loved ones that there is something wrong with their innate selfhoods. And then we say that this is God's will. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about what happens when somebody actually believes that. So let's just say somebody is born and raised a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or maybe they convert to the church and they have a very, very strong testimony of the truth claims of the church. And they go on to believe as they recognize that they have, uh, their sexual orientation is not heterosexual and that they're attracted to their own gender. What they do, if they have a strong and hearty testimony of the restoration of the gospel, is they begin to become in they experience internalized shame and they feel like there is something wrong with them. They try oftentimes to fix themselves. They try all of the methods of, you know, working through this or getting help or being righteous enough or repenting or just basically all the different hoops that they have jumped through traditionally to sort of align themselves with the teachings of the church. And what's happening through this whole entire process is a deeper sense of shame, a, a deeper sense of their own not enoughness or their own sense that they are wrong. And as this, this, this problem gets deeper and deeper, they become very, very psychologically ill and they become very, very spiritually ill. Okay. So let's talk about what she says here in the book. Carolyn mentions how damaging this is and how suicide is of course, one of the ultimate outcomes of somebody who lives in the terror of their own internalized shame that becomes very deep and pervasive because of their testimony of the truth claims of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its homophobic doctrine. I'm going to read a little piece here in the book that Carolyn talks about. She says this, a former surgeon general who spoke recently in Utah about suicide prevention, said that he was impressed with Utah's warm and friendly people. But he added, quote, in New York, we kill each other. In Utah, you kill yourselves. The newspaper gave the shocking statistic that Utah leads the entire nation in suicides among men 
between 15 and 24. Utah also has the 11th highest suicide rate over all age groups. Then this Carolyn goes on to say, all sorts of people kill themselves. The homosexual people who commit suicide then should not surprise us. But what should surprise, shock, and distress us is to realize that, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Resources, up to 30% of completed youth suicides are committed by gay and lesbian youth. The LDS Church News, in a 1994 article titled Suicide Rates Increase, Church Members Not Immune, reinforced that statistic, stating that, quote, the largest single group of teen suicides, about one-third of the total, consists of those who have gender identity problems. As gays compose somewhere around 5% of the general population, the disproportion is remarkable. Numerous complex phenomena are responsible for suicide. Mental health, personal traumas, and economics all play a role. But to me, it is clear that many suicides among young Mormons, Mormon homosexuals, as well as gay people of other religions can be traced directly to a hostile social and religious environment. So let's talk a little bit more about what this looks like in the real lives of real people. One of the things that is the most touching and the thing that makes me just cry the most as I have read this book and some of Carolyn's other books is that she infuses throughout the books the personal stories and letters of dozens of people who she has personal and intimate relationships with who have gone through this kind of of deep and profound suffering. So let's talk a little bit about what it's like to live with the internalized shame of a gay person who is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm going to kind of start midway through a story as she talks about a relationship that she had with somebody who was suffering and came to her for help. She says this as as she talks about a young man that had come to her who was on the verge of suicide. She says this, I felt again the utter helplessness of holding him as he sobbed for release of this thing that he was. As he collapsed under the terrible burden of being a gay boy in a Mormon family in a straight world. We and that world had taught him well. Homosexuality was unnatural and unholy. It was not of God. Later, he would tell me of the torment that haunted him during those dark nights. If God did not make gay people, then who made him? The nightmarish answer that came into his mind placed him so far outside of the circle of creation of what of which we had taught him that he despaired of living. He would rather be dead than gay, but in my arms he sobbed all the harder because he lacked the courage to kill himself. His self-loathing extended even to that. He was gay and he was a coward. So my healthy psychological paradigm number one is that it is imperative that we as human beings and children of God help every single person in our circle to know of their innate worthiness, to know that the way they came is beautiful, it's acceptable, and it is divine. The unhealthy paradigm is a doctrine that creates issues of internalized shame. And the thing that I find that is so heartbreaking in this situation is that oftentimes there's a direct correlation between the folks who believe in the church and then hate themselves because they have such a profound internalized shame about what it means to be themselves through the eyes of the church. Okay, let's move on now to healthy paradigm number two. The, health, the second psychological paradigm that I want to spend a few minutes talking with you guys about is this idea of a parent's unconditional love for their child. Now, I am a parent of four children, two young adults and two teenagers. And of course, I'm no stranger to the fact that we have certainly complicated relationships with our children. And I know that we love them all and some of them are so much eat, you know, they're just delightful and others of them are challenges. But at the end of the day, I believe to my core that we are put here in families to learn. We're put here in families to become made over in the image of God through our joys and through our struggles and through our pains. But there is something wired into us that helps us really relate to what it means to be like God 
as we learn how to love our children the way that God loves us. So that is the healthy paradigm that I want to talk about. Children are our are, are gifts from God. And we as parents learn how to see as God sees as we learn how to parent our children and come to this place of unconditional love for them. The unhealthy paradigm that is introduced because of the doctrines that we currently have in the church is sometimes an explicit and an obvious, and sometimes a it's a little bit more implicit, but it's basically a rejection of our ch children in the service of being loyal to the institution. So what that may look like is, and I've talked about this, and Nathan and I have talked about this quite a bit in other podcast episodes, but one of the bigger issues that, that, that I want us all to be thinking about and working on as we psychologically grow is that sometimes we overcouple our relationship with God with our relationship with the church, meaning that when we struggle with the church, we somehow correlate that or think it's the same as struggling with God. Well, it's not the same. Those are two very, very different things. Our relationship with God is actually completely and totally independent of our relationship with the institution. Sometimes the institution can be instrumental in helping us become closer to God, but sometimes the institution is not helpful at all. And so we have to make sure that we're not make, we're not coupling those. We're not combining those and making them one and the same. And sometimes what, what I have noticed as, as I look at the, what the doctrine has taught parents is that they have to choose the institution and their, the truth claims of the institution and the doctrine over their relationship with their own flesh and blood, with their own children. Throughout this book, Carolyn tells experiences of people that have come to her and shared with her their experiences of coming out to their parents. And gratefully, some of these stories are happy stories. They are parents that accept their children and as is expected, some of the stories are tragic and devastating. And she talks about in great detail, this problem, this sense that sometimes in, in, in a way that is kind of hard to comprehend, some parents will turn on their children and turn their child into an other. And I use other in kind of like hand quotes, which is this idea that all of the sudden, because of one thing that a person says, they all of a sudden become almost like another kind of creature where, where the parent is able to, in a way that is incomprehensible, almost they're able to look at their children and, and reject them. These are Carolyn's words. She says this, that an idea, my child is gay, could be so powerful a shock that within minutes, years of love, devotion, service, and admiration are transformed into horror and condemnation is astonishing that a belief should invade the sacred space of a mother's love like a poison dart and suddenly turn a beloved son into the other, a despised other, leaves me reeling. Now, this that's a cl close quote. This brought to me kind of a, a flash of, of inspiration as I was thinking about and reading this portion of the book where Carolyn was talking about how stating it is for people when parents reject their own children because they express to their parents that they are in some way, shape, or form a sexual or a gender minority. And the revelation that I had is this. I grew up in the era where we would look at the Bible and use biblical phrases conveniently to justify our marginalization and our oppression of gender and sexual minorities. And as I was reading this book, I thought about the term unnatural affection that has been used to oppress the marginalized. And it occurred to me like a shock that went all through my entire body that the unnatural affection that the Bible is speaking of may very well be the unnatural ways in which parents are inclined to reject their own children because they cleave to the dogma and the teachings of an institution more than they cleave to the children that God gave them. Carolyn goes on to discuss not only that, the, you know, the sad and depressing experiences of people who of children and young adults who come out to their families and are rejected, but she also really goes deeply into 
and very beautifully discusses the potential that couples and families have to really sink into the healthy paradigm that he, we are here as human beings to learn how to be made over in the image of our heavenly parents and that this unconditional love for our children can extend certainly as far as all of, of who they become, who they are, who they're here to become. And she says this, when you have a child, you start to dream of how this kid will grow up and make you proud. The only thing you can predict with 100% certainty is that the reality will diverge somehow from that dream. Some of our children will disappoint us by not being the scholars they hope they would be. Some children will disappoint us by not being the athletes they hope they would be. Some will disappoint us by coming out and telling us that they are gay and that they will not give us grandchildren. The real question is not, what book can I read? What technique can I use to raise a perfect child? The real question is, how will you handle the gap between the child you dreamt of having and the real child growing up in your home? What I have learned is that any, in any religion, if you do it wrong, it will leave people feeling condemned and dismissed and unworthy. And any religion, if you do it right, it will leave people feeling cleansed and affirmed. She goes on to talk about how we as parents can love our children and how this will bless all of us as the family. She says this, this child, she's referring in this case to a gender, a sexual or gender minority child. This child who has always been God's gift to you may now be the cause of another gift. Your family becoming more honest, respectful, and supportive. Yes, your love can be tested by this reality, but it can also grow stronger through your struggle to respond lovingly. It is my feeling that we who have been born and raised in a, a conservative Christian religion in a country that has a history of marginalizing gender and sexual minorities have a big job before us because we're going to have to learn how to become larger than the culture around us. I think it's becoming easier now. I think we're in a place of shift and change, and this is becoming more and more acceptable. The marginalized are being stood up for, especially outside of the more conservative Christian religions, at least here in the United States. And so it's our responsibility to overcome the false traditions of our fathers and our mothers from our from the context of our religious background and and to recognize that perfect love casts out all fear and that we can become purified as we truly live the gospel of Jesus Christ the parts of the gospel that we have been taught that are more reflective of our relationship with God who is known for love and then we can shun and turn away from those doctrines and dogmas that are not expressive of or encouraging of true and deep godlike love. And I believe this is something that we can do at all ages. We can overcome what we have been taught, what has been embedded in us, what has sort of been loaded into us that may bring up experiences or feelings of fear or a sense of the unknown or a sense of anxiety or even negative feelings. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a story that Carolyn tales in No More Goodbyes. She talks about a young man who was a Jewish comedian who tells a story of going home to his grandmother and talking to her about his coming out as gay. He gave her a book, a copy of the book called Now That You Know, and it's, it's basically everything you always wanted to know about homosexuality, but were afraid to hear. And then he talks, this is, I'm going to quote this. This is really sweet. He says this, Two weeks later, I came, I went to a visit to my grandmother to do some laundry. I can see the book laying on the nightstand. The wrinkled spine and folded corners tell me that it has been read. I turned to Granny, who was working busily on another Afghan. Hey, Granny, I said, did you read the book? The crochet hook stops. She looks up and points and says point blank, yes, and it's disgusting. My heart sinks and my guard goes up. I said, disgusting? She says, yes, it's disgusting. It says that some parents don't even love their children anymore. 
this makes me cry. Close quote. Clearly it made him cry and it's making me cry too. I told you, you guys, this book, gets, it just gets to me. It just gets to me. What this story illustrates is that even an elderly woman can learn to love a child, her own child, her own grandchild, and that she is a beautiful example of what we call natural affection, that we unconditionally love our children and love our grandchildren, even as they end up maturing and becoming beautifully themselves, even if that version of themselves is different than we may have imagined. But what we do is we accept the beauty that is them because they are a manifestation of how God made them. Here is another sweet story that Carolyn tells called The Blessing. It's written by a young gay man. He says this, in the fall, my father suffered a heart attack and was rushed into surgery. My siblings and I gathered at the hospital. As we sat in the waiting room, my two brothers began talking to each other about giving him a priesthood blessing. Having left the Mormon church years earlier on account of my sexuality, I was not included in the conversation. Though it was clear to me that they were not trying to be unkind, I had that usual struggle with painful feelings of feeling left out. Finally, we were ushered into the room where my father was recovering from his surgery. He was understandably weak, his eyes half closed, but he seemed to recognize each of us. As my younger brother anointed his head with oil and gave a short prayer, my two sisters and I watched from the other side of the room. After the anointing prayer, both of my brothers began to place their hands on my father's head to seal the anointing and bless him. Suddenly, my father raised his hand into the air and stopped them. Surprised, we all looked at each other. His eyes scanned the room until they came to rest upon me. He motioned for me to come over to the bed. Not knowing what I, he wanted, I slowly approached him. As I reached the bed, he took hold of my right hand. Without a word, he placed my hands firmly upon his own head, and then he did the same with my left hand. He then closed his eyes. After a brief and somewhat awkward pause, my brothers placed their hands on top of mine, and my brother gave him a blessing. As I pondered this simple gesture over the months and years that followed, I have come to I've come to the strong belief that my father did exactly what Christ would do. My father's instinct told him that above all other considerations, he needed to let me know that he sees me as a worthy and lovable son, equal to my brothers, and that my sexual orientation made no difference to him. It was a transformative experience and pivotal for my life. Okay, I'm going to close that story deeply and profoundly touched by this story. The only small addendum that I would make, and you guys know me, I like to throw my own two cents into all of the things that we talk about here on this podcast. My, my, if I were to just change the ending just a little bit, I would have had his two sisters invited into the blessing as well. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so I'm going to just briefly review healthy paradigm number one is that we are innately worthy. Healthy paradigm number two is parents are given the gift to unconditionally love their children. Now I want to talk about healthy paradigm number three and, and really kind of push back against the unhealthy paradigm that is currently taught in our current doctrine. Healthy paradigm number three is that the family is a, a profoundly important unit in the creation of a healthy human being. And so the healthy paradigm of the family is that we support the family unit in whatever its configuration. On the flip side, the unhealthy paradigm that I want to talk about that we have to overcome as we gently but firmly really push back against the current doctrine and dogma and theology in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that there is a prescription currently for the right kind of family and that there is condemnation for the wrong kind of family. I want to just talk for a second, or at least share with you what Carolyn says about this idea of the LGBTQ population having an anti-traditional family. There's an idea out there that there is only one kind of family, the traditional family, with a father and a mother and children. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that fundamentally, but she says this. She says, when anti-gay advocates use the term traditional I always wonder what tradition and what time. 
do we support early 19th century traditional marriages when married women had no legal standing, could not own property, could not sign contracts or legally control any earned wages? I also find it somewhat hypocritical for the church to appeal to people's emotions and use the quote traditional argument when it was on the receiving end of such abuse during the polygamy era. The church, more than anyone in this country, should know how persecution should feel. She goes on to say, the false dilemma is that one is either pro-homosexuality or pro-family. This, of course, is false. So what Carolyn here is trying to help us better understand is the idea of a traditional family is, is complicated historically for a lot of reasons. Number one, during the polygamy era, era, there was nothing traditional about the practice of polygamy, and we were considered outcasts, you know, for yeah, arguably good reasons. And so for us to be advocates of a certain very, very rigid constellation in the family unit is somewhat hypocritical. And then the other part that she brings up that I, you know, completely co-sign out of my own, you know, for my, as I think about this myself is, is what does that even mean to be a traditional family? What, what I believe to be the psychologically healthy paradigm is to uphold and support family units that are trying to take care of one another. They're trying to love one another. They're trying to learn how to be selfless, service-oriented, giving, kind, sharing, and basically human beings that are trying to be made over in the image of God. She tells a story of, um, in this book of a young man who shares the journey that he went with his parents on as he came out, and then he ended up marrying his partner. And it was a very challenging period for his, his family and his partner and his parents. But he talks about one day as things, as, as the years went by, and one day his mother said to him, I don't remember his name because I don't have the quote right here in front of me, but, but she said, basically, she said, so son, who does most of the cooking in your family? And the young man said, this healed me so much because she finally acknowledged that we were a family. And that was a long time coming because they weren't the same kind of family that maybe she anticipated. And he knew always that he was a family. That he was part of a family. And he did the same kinds of things that, that healthy, striving families do. These, these, same gender, these same gendered families and other sexual and gender minority families, they get up in the night when their partner is sick. They take care of each other. They listen when their partner needs a listening ear. They have their good days. They have their bad days. They grow. They suffer. They struggle. They overcome. They are a traditional family if what they're doing in this life is they're pair bonding and they're learning how to overcome their own selfish inclinations, which I believe is what family is all about. We have to be careful right now as we in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints may be perpetuating microaggressions as we just live out the doctrines that are taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints right now, because, be because of the current doctrine in the church, same gender attracted and gay and lesbian and transgendered couples and families are not able to enter the temple, which according to the doctrine means they're not able to be together forever as families. So when we teach this doctrine, we are basically barring from heaven, those sexual and gender minority people. Carolyn Pearson goes on to say this in her book, the territory that Mormon children travel is well marked. From our first day in Sunday school, we begin to learn what we have to do to make it back to Heavenly Father's presence. One of the things heard hundreds and hundreds of times is that we must marry in the temple and raise a righteous family. Songs imprinted in our minds, words like these. When I am in my early years, I'll prepare most carefully so I can marry in God's temple for eternity. Families can be together forever through Heavenly Father's plan. I always want to be with my own family, and the Lord has shown me how I can. She goes on to say, these may be beautiful, inspiring words for most children to hear, 
But if there are 40 children in the room, two or three are likely on a collision course with these beautiful words, especially the boys who not only represent a greater percentage of those with homosexual orientation, but who receive more pressure to initiate marriage than girls do. As they mature and feel those first twinges of sexual attraction to other males, they suppress the feelings because they know it is an absolute, it is absolutely forbidden to grow up to be a homosexual. Homosexuals are the people who do not love God and who are ev whose evil is so huge that God cannot bear the sight of them. These sweet young men love God. Therefore, it is simply not possible that they really are gay. It is hard for me to find fault with any of these many gay men I have talked to who chose to do what they believe beyond question God expected of them, which is to marry a woman and procreate. The irony seems, the ironies seem never to end. My Mormon culture places a higher value on family than any other culture I know of. And yet we continue to create family after family that is virtually doomed to fail. Collateral damage, perhaps some say, in the war we are fighting against disintegrating values. But when it is your family, your daughter, your son, or yourself, the collateral damage is unacceptable. So the bottom line is we as members of the church have to do a better job. We have to be very, very careful about how we are creating microaggressions in the, in the church for our gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgendered loved ones, friends and family who may come to church. We have to recognize that even if the doctrine speaks this way, that we cannot be endorsing these kinds of ideas that are putting them on what Pearson calls a collision course with their own sense of identity. We have to help them recognize that we believe in contrast to the teachings of the church at present, we believe in their innate, their innate worthiness. We believe in their capacity that they will in fact go back and live with their heavenly parents, just like we will, and that there's nothing wrong or, or broken about them. As a matter of fact, some churches are doing a much better job than we are. I'm going to read just a little piece written to Carolyn from a, from a gay man that talks about having left the church and joined a co congregational United Church of Christ. He says this, the UCC service reminds me so much of an LDS sacrament meeting, young couples, elderly couples, an extended family visiting this week. Children are grinning at me in the pew ahead. Some folks worship with an arm around a partner and a good number of couples happen to be same sex couples. So that's of course different than our church. Back to the quote, the first time I attended, I thought, whoa, where are all those perverts, drug dealers, and child molesters? These same-sex couples are worshiping God, and they're friendly and kind and benevolent and virtuous. They're going out of their way individually and as a church to do remarkable works of charity service in the community. There are heterosexual children with, ch with there are heterosexual couples with children. There are gay and lesbian couples with children. There are transgender people and there are elderly people and, the, and their sexual orientation is not an issue of their worship. This is most profound for me when at the end of the service, everyone stands, hold hands, holds hands around the chapel and sings the first verse of God be with you till we meet again. And at the end of the song, hands are squeezed, all are smiling at each other and all are hugging. The spirit of God is as powerful as I have ever felt in any meeting house or temple. So if we haven't already done so before, let's go ahead and just get over this idea that we have it all figured out in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know we have, we have some beautiful things that we can add to, to larger religion, but we also fall way, way behind in certain ways. And this particular example that was just given of this congregational church that is, is a beautiful representation of something that we can strive for in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm a big believer, as you guys all know, that, that churches in general, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. We have our strengths in the LDS Church and we have our weaknesses. And I'm articulating specifically, of course, our weaknesses, but we also have our strengths. And, and yet, Right now, in terms of gender and sexual minorities, 
we're falling behind. And if we're ever hurting people and hurting people deeply, we have to do better. I love the story that I just told because it really, really shines a light on what we are capable of. Now I want to share with you a story. I hope I can actually get through this because it is, it's a tough one. This is a story that it's an experience of none other than the inspirational Lowell Benyon, who was the greatest mentor of Eugene England. And these are giants in the field of progressive Mormonism. They're amazing. I'm just going to read a little bit about his own experience and his family. And mind you, this was, this, this all happened quite a long time ago, long before there was anything like what we experience now as acceptance has grown for our sexual and gender minority friends and family. Carolyn says this, Lowell Benyon, one of the best known and most beloved teachers and humanitarians in Mormondom said this, I am willing to walk by faith in darkness, but the problem comes when I am called upon to do something that goes against the spirit that I am accustomed to hearkening to when it also goes against what I think is at the very heart and soul of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of theology. Carolyn goes on to say that sentiment was spoken during a time in Lowell Benyon's service when the church was withholding priesthood privileges from black people, but it emerged again in his life when his own son Howard told him that he was a homosexual man. Howard had had Two previ- Howard had made two previous efforts to follow the traditional path that young, of young Mormon men in missionary service, but he just couldn't do it. Finally, on his third try, after his mother had purchased the missionary clothing and scriptures for him, he told the bishop that he just couldn't go, that he finally had accepted the fact that he was homosexual. At the urging of his bishop, Howard then told his father, Lowell's biographer, Mary Bradford, says that the news, quote, caused Lowell to burst into tears. I've never seen him cry like that, said Howard, not before nor since. It just crushed him. This was an issue that very few families of the 1960s and 70s were prepared to deal with. But Lowell and his wife, Orthodox Mormons though they were, refused to let this come between them and their son. They learned that they they learned all that they could about homosexuality and concluded that it was an inborn trait. They stayed close to their son through long depression and through a suicide attempt and urged him to work towards an RN degree and invited him and his partner to build a home on their property. After Howard had been living quietly with a partner for several years, not attending church, not calling attention to himself in warder community, the bishop and the stake president in the area convened a church court to review his worthiness to remain a member of the church. Howard recalled that he was profoundly touched when his father called with the words, I want to testify, will you pick me up? During the church court proceedings at which Howard was excommunicated, he found himself moved to tears when he heard his father speak in his defense, saying, How can you judge this young man? You don't even know him. At the end of Lowell Benyon's life, his relationship with his son was still loving and strong. Howard nursed his father unto his last days and was present at his death. We need to do better. And I'm inspired by Lowell Benyon, even in the 60s and 70s, that he stood by his son's side and he, he sensed truth long before science was validating the truth that homosexuality is inborn. He knew truth. He was truly a pioneer. And we are lucky to have him. And it is our responsibility to stand on his shoulders Truth takes a long time to be embraced by large institutions, but it's our responsibility to stand up for truth and not allow any more people to be hurt. Okay, let's move on to paradigm number four. And I'm going to discuss with you this idea of human attachment. So let me just give you a little bit of a background of what I'm talking about here before I incorporate it with Carolyn Pearson's analysis and and the book, No More Goodbyes. 
Okay, so the idea of secure attachment is that when we are children, our brains basically map whether or not the world is safe. And we do this mapping unconsciously, and it generally happens in the first couple of years of our lives. And within the first two or so years of our lives, if our primary caregivers, if our grownups that take care of us are fairly consistent and fairly reliable, then we decide, we kind of generalize and decide that the world is generally pretty reliable and we can count on it and we become securely attached human beings, meaning that we recognize that we can rely upon people to most often take care of us. And if they don't take care of us, or if they make a mistake, we can rely on the fact that most of the time they will come around and make things right with us. So a securely attached child or a child who is securely attached to their parents becomes a more or less emotionally confident and competent human being. And this secure attachment actually translates into how they experience other relationships on up into their intimate relationships in their adult years. Now, there are three other ways that people end up relating to the world if they're not in a securely attached relationship with the grownups in their lives. And that is, I'll be very brief with this, but that's people can become anxiously attached, meaning that if the, if the grown up or the caregiver is inconsistent, basically the child learns that they have to really make a fuss to get their needs met, or they can, on the other hand, be avoidantly attached, which means a child early on can also map that their parents are probably not going to be there to get those needs met. So the child learns how to meet those needs, their psychological needs as best as they can by themselves. And they do this by minimizing the fact that they have needs. So they're really those people that kind of shove those needs deep down and are not very emotionally aware of their needs. Okay. And there's a fourth category, which is the one that I really want to talk about today. And that is somebody who has a disorganized attachment style. And that means that in, in this paradigm, sometimes a child's parents may love them and want them to, you know, want them, want, want to take care of them. But those same parents, for whatever reason, those same parents abuse them. They hurt them. These can be alcoholic parents, or these can be somebody who is struggling in any number of ways. There can be mental health issues. There can be poverty. There can be lots of overwork. There can be, these parents can be abused themselves, but for whatever reason, the child experiences a parent that is both the one who they want to run towards and the one who they want to run away from. And so their protector is also their abuser. This is the, the, the saddest and the most traumatic kind of attachment relationship that a child will have with their parents because they don't actually know how to be in a healthy, trusting relationship with people around them. They acknowledge that they want connection. They know that they have needs and they want those needs to be met, but they're terrified that they will be hurt when they actually move towards the people that they love because that has been their history. And so oftentimes they, they, they live in a lot of anguish and confusion, and they tend to also sometimes actually sabotage their healthy relationships or their potentially healthy relationships because they're so frightened that will be abandoned or betrayed or abused because that is in fact their history with their primary care caregivers. So as I was reading Carolyn Pearson's book, No More, no More Goodbyes, and I was listening to, or I guess taking in some of these stories, it occurred to me as I sort of superimposed my psychology lens onto this book that many of our LGBTQ plus loved ones, fam family and friends who are historically have been or are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints actually probably have what I would consider to be a disorganized attachment with the church, meaning that there are parts of the church, of their history, of the way they've been socialized, of their beliefs, of even their own personal experiences where they feel love, they feel safety, they feel money. They associate their relationship with the church with, with, with the love of God. And yet at the same time, especially as their own unique sexuality emerges, what they experience is something that is the opposite of that. They get messages from the church that are anything but, or the furthest thing from love, care, compassion, joy in, in what 
this person is evolving into. And so they may want to run towards the church, but they also at the same time may feel compelled to run away from the church. And they translate that into a desire to both run towards God, who they have come to love through their relationship with the church and their early religious education and experiences, but they also may feel to hide from God because they are so self-loathing. This returns a little bit, this returns me a little bit to what I talked about in my healthy paradigm number one, where I talked about this innate our, our innate lovability is a psych psychological concept number one of all healing that I do in my own personal work. So what I have noticed as I think about these people and the disorganized relationship that they have with God and with the church is that the reason why they have this disorganized relationship is because they may love God, they may love the church, but they learn to hate themselves because they have incorporated incorporated and internalized the homophobia of the institution that has raised them and helped create their identity as children of God. Remember what I mentioned earlier in this hour is to the extent that they have a testimony of God and Jesus Christ, and they have that fused with the church, the stronger the fusion, the stronger the internalized homophobia and the stronger the confusion that they will feel and the possibility that they could be loved by a God who the church is telling them cannot love them because of who they are, because of their sexual orientation. Okay, now I'm going to illustrate this with a beautiful and tragic story that is part of this book. So just bear with me and see, let me see how well I can get through this. This is what she says. She says, it was the first time I had spoken in public since Goodbye, I Love You was published. The audience was Affirmation, the Association for Gay and Lesbian Mormons and Ex-Mormons at their annual conference in San Francisco. When I finished my talk and I took a seat at the round table, a young man to my left touched my arm and looked at me with the saddest and most guileless brown eyes I had ever seen. Sister Pearson, he said, do you know what breaks my heart and makes me want to just give up? What, Brad? We had just met and had just made light conversation over the meal. And then he said this, in the next life, I want to be where people like you are, where God and Jesus are. And to know that I can never be there makes me just want to give up. I stared at him. He was serious. Brad, how can you say that? His answer, well, it's true. I was at a loss for words. I said, how? Who? Brad? That's, that's awful. That's not true. My heart began to pound. How dare they? How dare anyone make this sweet young man at my side feel so unworthy, feel forever barred from the presence of God and from Christ, and even absurdly, even from me? No, Brad, I said vehemently. We've got it all wrong. No one can make a judgment like that. Your relationship with God is a private, sacred thing, and God loves you, and there is a place for you. As the evening ended, Brad and I hugged, and, and he said, I wish I had a friend like you. I said, I'll be your friend, Brad. I kissed his cheek, and I gave him my phone number, and I said goodbye. So Brad and I became friends. Later on, he told me his story. He was converted to the church in his early 20s. He had never known such warmth and such good people, such love as he found there. He drank it in, a thirsty, true believer. But he was gay. He said, I'm 100% gay, not just 99%. I have never had a single or the slightest sexual feelings towards a woman. When I was baptized, I knew I would change. I knew that Jesus would heal me, but it didn't happen. And I didn't understand why. I love the Lord. I love the church. I love the gospel. I studied the scriptures. I paid my tithing. I fasted. I obeyed all the commandments, but I was still gay. I went on a mission. I came home and I was still gay. I was terrified. I knew that the next step was marriage. God wanted me to marry, and the church wanted me to marry, So just and just thinking about it terrified me. He proceeds to talk about going to his bishop, and for every single week for a whole year, he fasted, and the bishop gave him a blessing to help him overcome his gayness. He came to realize that nothing would change, and what ended up happening was he succeeded in feeling nothing for anyone. His emotions had completely died. And he realized that he was never going to change and that he was just destined to go to the lowest 
of God's kingdoms. So he goes on to say, I figured I would just go get a lot of pills. I collected them for weeks. One evening I took them all. I knew I would have about 15 minutes until the effects set in. So I drove up to the Provo temple. I figured that it would be the place that I wanted to die. I believed that there would be kind and helpful spirits around the temple. And that when I passed over, there would be someone there willing to help me. I sat there on the grounds and I felt the waves of blackness come over me. I lost consciousness. Two weeks later, I woke up from a coma and they told me what had happened. The next morning, a BYU professor on his way to work had found me in the field spread eagle on the ground. The doctor said it had been so cold that my metabolism had slowed down and the pills had not finished their work. He talks later about having to drop out of the church because he felt so bad about himself and what it meant to be a member of the church and someone who was gay. But he said, I go to church every day in my heart and I go to the temple every day in my heart. Brad's social life had never been wild, but he did have several partners. And a few months into the relationship, he told me that he had tested it for HIV. It added to his negative feelings and the conflict he felt with, with daily over his self-worth. On several occasions during those difficult days, Brad and I prayed together, and I used those times to give him reassurance of God's love for him, to help him, to tell him that the anguish that he had felt for so many years over his unworthiness had caused the heavens to grieve. I told him that the Lord walked beside him and that his body and spirit were in the hands of one wiser than both of us. Once he said, it's so hard not to be a part of the church. Sometimes when I'm really, really low, I give myself a blessing. I put my hands on my head and I give myself a blessing. He broke into sobs and couldn't speak for a while. Then he went on, and these are his exact words, which I copy now from his diary, from my diary. He said, the Mormons have got to stop being so rejecting. To be rejected by something so wonderful as the Mormon church is nearly more than a person can bear. Okay, I'm going to end the story right there because it's going to make me cry too much. <laughs> but what this is talking about, everyone, is this is a perfect example of a disorganized attachment relationship. It's psychologically completely crazy making when the thing that you love is the thing that rejects you. You want to run towards it. And you have to run away from it because it loves you and it hurts you. This is psychologically traumatic. It's psychologically damaging. And we have to do better. This is not a healthy way to be in relationship with a human being, with an institution. And it's not a healthy way to even invite someone to be in relationship with God, which is what is actually going on right now with the current doctrines and theology. Okay, I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk to you about healthy paradigm, healthy psychological paradigm number five as we wrap this episode up. This healthy paradigm is, is one that is, the, the beautiful thing about the work that I do is psychologically whole principles and theologically whole principles. The principles of wellness are always the same and it's no exception here. The principle here is that unconditional, unconditional love transforms, heals, and is always creative. On the flip side, the unhealthy paradigm that we're trying to overcome as we reform or we work towards reform is that conditional love is not of God and it does not heal and it is innately and inherently destructive. I am mostly to right now, I'm going to just focus on the healthy paradigm. I feel like I've done plenty to talk about the, this entire podcast has really been articulating, I think pretty clearly what Carolyn is trying to teach us about how love creates true love. Godlike love is unconditional and it is creative. It's a creative power. Whereas conditional love, it destroys people. It destroys their, their sense of self. It destroys their self-esteem it, it destroys their capacity to, to love themselves, to connect with others and to even ultimately connect with, with God, because they don't know how to connect with, with the God that they have learned how to understand, which is not the God that is really there that wants to be in connection with them. So what Carolyn is talking about here is how, even in the face of misunderstanding of, of an, the not understanding of science and of the struggles and the pain 
of people that are, are rejecting of our LGBTQ plus families and loved ones and friends, what Carolyn is actually teaching us and inviting us is to practice an increase of love. She says this, love has redemptive power. And there is power there that eventually transforms individuals. And that is why Jesus says, love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem and to, re and to transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover at the very root of love is the power of redemption. And by the power of you lo your love, they will break down under the load. That's love, you see. It is redemptive. And this is why Jesus says to love. There's something about love that builds up and is creative. And there's something about hate that tears down and destroys. So we need to love our enemies. And right now, what I think she's referring to as our enemies are people that are not really, you know, how we traditionally think of enemies, but we have to love the people that don't understand. We have to love the ignorant. We have to love those who think they know what is right and true. We have to love those who are trying to tell us that there's something that we should, that, the, that are trying to tell the, our, our loved ones that there's something wrong with them. We have to even love them and we have to recognize that it is through our love and through the, our voices that we ultimately will have the power to change their hearts ultimately or help God change their hearts, I should say. In this section, Carolyn actually talks about someone who decided that he would not trade hatred for hatred or fear for fear, but he would actually exchange love for hate after he had come out. He said this, they drew a circle that left me out and I drew a circle that kept them in. And then Carolyn ends by saying this, as we live our lives with dignity, transparency, and generosity and forgiveness, we change the landscape. I ask this of all of us, draw your circle, Make it as expansive and inclusive as you can. With hope and love, draw your circle and let others in. Isn't that what Jesus said? I believe he said, bless them that curse you. Okay, so we are ending up this rather long episode where I am talking to you about the beautiful work of Carolyn Pearson and giving you a little bit of a book review on her book, No More Goodbyes, that teaches us all about how to love and how to uh, an eternal perspective on our LGBTQ plus friends and loved ones. And I also ta have taken you through this book from the lens of what healthy paradigms look like in relationship, in love, in family, in connection, and in attachment. I'm going to go ahead and close up by reading a little bit about what she says as far as hope and how we can ultimately heal as a community. And what she's gonna talk about here is this idea of raising our consciousness, which is a, just a huge topic that I love and I emphasize in my own work all of the time. She says this, sometimes I like to climb up in what I call my spirit, I want, <laughs> let me try that again. Sometimes I like to climb up in what I call my spiritual helicopter and look down at life on earth, my own life, the life of the human family, I like to see where we've been, imagine where we're going, get a little perspective on today. The journey is one of consciousness. I am very clear on that. Years ago, Gerald, her husband, ever the philosopher, quoted to me something that I cannot repeat quite correctly, and I don't even know who said it, but it says something like this, the only battles that count are the battles that are fought on the field of consciousness. We can track consciousness from this high helicopter, you and I. We can look down at the landscape, watch history. As it goes back and back and back, we can see the darkness of unconsciousness illuminated from time to time by the light of consciousness. Look, there, hard to believe. We thought the gods appreciated human sacrifice. We thought it was just fine for one man to own another in slavery. We accepted the idea that women did not even have souls. We were indifferent to the genocide of millions of Native Americans. Large numbers of us accepted that Hitler's ethnic cleansing was a fine idea. Looking down at that slowly moving demarcation, the border of now, we see the ongoing birth of higher consciousness. It is not a straight climb, but surely it's three steps forward for every one step back. 
where then will our consciousness be 10 years, 30 years, 50 years from now, assuming the world lasts? You have your list of hopes, I am sure, and I have mine. I hope and believe there will be more consciousness in our human family being part of the larger creation, part of the environment. The feminine principle, both mortal and divine, will have established a stronger presence. We will be closer to a ceasefire over who owns God. Our religions will have remembered that each has deeply embedded in its platforms a version of the golden rule. We will have stopped creating divisions and will instead celebrate our common humanity and our common divinity. We will be more reverent of the place and the power of sexuality. Our heterosexual majority will have ceased reviling and persecuting our gay brothers and sisters, and we will look back and shake our heads and say, can you believe that in the time of religion we drove these people to suicide? So Carolyn ends her book by taking us back. This is actually how she began her book too. She talks about this idea of protecting and how we as Mormon pioneers would circle our wagons to protect each other from danger. And she kind of begins that way about trying to protect our LGBTQ plus loved ones. And she ends the book that way too. And this is how she ends. She compares that story that we've all heard several times about the, the Mormon pioneers being stuck in the plains and Brigham Young gathering them together on a Sunday and saying this, I will tell you that all of your faith, religion, and profession of religion will never save one soul of you in the celestial kingdom of God unless you carry out just such principles as I am teaching now. Go and bring those people in from the plains. And so she's referencing Brigham Young, but now she's taking over that plea and she's offering it from herself to us. And she says this, she says, today I have written in with a report that I feel is an urgent one. I am not the only writer, but I am the one that you are hearing now and she, because we're reading her book. <laughs> and she says this, there are large numbers of our homosexual people who are safe and warm, who have high self-esteems and healthy relationships with their families and friends and with God. For many of them, that well-being has been purchased at a high price and their scars are deep. But I speak to you now of those who are suffering today, a group of our own who have been caught in a fierce winter, a winter that is largely of our own making. Some of them are dying. You have read this book only about a few, but across the human family, there are millions. I am asking you to look beyond your prejudices and your judgment and see the human beings who have been left out in the cold. So the way she closes this book is by inviting each and every one of us to look around us, to consider what is it that we are doing? What is it that we are not doing? What is it that could, we could be doing better? How can we love individuals better in our wards, in our stakes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools? How can we teach our children to love these marginalized populations? How can we be reformers in our own church community? How can we be the voice for change? I want us to just remember for a moment and reflect that it was not very many years ago when our own parents or maybe our grandparents had the choice to make. Were they going to stay quiet and were they going to allow the church to continue to oppress a racial minority or were they going to stand up and voice up and speak truth to power. Now, it is our responsibility and it's our privilege. This is the civil rights issue of our day. And we need to protect and save and bring in this gender and sexual minority population. These are families, our friends, our loved ones, our children, our siblings, our neighbors, our ward members. Carolyn Pearson's plea to us is to help us see that we are the voice. It is up to us to protect, to save, to be the voice. If we are active members of this church, we have made covenants that we will mourn with those that mourn, that we will comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and that we will stand as a witness of God. And the way I see that 
as we stand as witnesses of God, what we are doing is we are acting as God would act and we are loving as God would love. And so it's our responsibility to follow this beautiful prophetess, Carolyn Pearson, in bringing our loved ones to safety. Okay, that is the book, No More Goodbyes. I don't know that I've ever read scripture more sacred than this book that I've just shared with you today. Let me just briefly review with you the healthy paradigm that I am forwarding alongside of the unhealthy paradigm that we're having to overcome. Healthy paradigm number one is that we are innately worthy. Unhealthy paradigm is that there is a doctrine that creates issues of internalized shame. Healthy paradigm number two is the unconditional love between a parent and a child ought to be celebrated. Unhealthy paradigm number two is that sometimes parents have been conditioned to choose loyalty over institution, over loyalty and love for their own child. Healthy paradigm number three is the support of a cohesive family unit that helps people learn how to be made over in the image of God by pair bonding and loving and caring for this small unit. Unhealthy paradigm number three is the prescription of the right kind of family and the condemnation of the wrong kind of family. Healthy paradigm number four is that secure attachment is a relationship between a child and a parent where the child feels innately safe and that the parent is going to be consistent with them and that therefore the world can be seen as safe also. Unhealthy paradigm number four is that a parent is inconsistent and shows both love but also disdain and hatred for the child which then confuses and traumatizes the brain of the child. And healthy paradigm number five is that unconditional love transforms and is creative, while conditional love is, does not heal and is destructive. All right. Okay. Once again, this was a big one. I gave my whole heart to you in these last couple of episodes, as I have shared with you my greater and deepening understanding of issues of gender and sexual minorities and how we as a church need to do better, and how we, those of you who are listening to this, um, do what you can. Decide what is right for you to do so that you can be instruments in helping move this cause forward. If this is a podcast that is meaningful to you, please share it with those in your circles. I love your ratings and reviews. They are very meaningful to me. And also, if you're interested in joining one of the quickly, I'm forming groups pretty much every couple of weeks. If you want a small community where you can learn, grow, and feel the support of those like-minded and like-hearted who are trying to navigate their relationship with the church or around the church, this is the right place for you. You can just reach out to me at info at ValerieHammaker.com or on Instagram at Latter-day Struggles Podcast. All right, you guys, Nathan will be back with us next time, and we're going to shift gears and start talking about issues around the youth in the church for the next few episodes. So we will see you then. Bye-bye.